It occurred to me today that I have never finished the video series that explained how the studio construction was finished. So I figure I can fill in some of the blanks on some of the questions that people may be asking. Things like, what kind of microphone cabling did you use? What kind of uh, mixer did you choose to put into the studio? How did you finish the walls? Things like that. These are all uh, things that were talked about in advance of finishing. And the studio has been done for some time, but I never got around to finishing the video series. So that's what I figure I can cover today to close out the series and maybe answer the questions as a follow-up. If, if you have questions about the procedures that were followed or anything regarding the studio construction itself, feel free to post them in the comments and I'll try to get back to you. So this is the uh, entryway into the studio itself. Uh, the construction, as you can see, it's a little bit rustic looking, I guess is the word. It's unfinished on the outside. And I don't really care about that because I'm not using this for you know, commercial use. This is for my own use. And if a friend of the family has a band and they want to do some recording, then they give me a call and they swing by. The uh, studio on the inside, uh, it's maybe a little dirty right now, but as you can see, we've got uh, the, the ceiling turned out pretty well. I didn't bother with uh, putting molding on the edges because that provides an opportunity for rattle. Uh, if the molding kind of rattles loose from the bass or the, the drum vibrations in the room, then you can end up with a rattle in the room. I did put molding around the outside edges because it's a perfectly flat surface. And you can see the, uh, where the water heater was, I ended up not putting in a wall at all because I'm sure that, that water heater is going to need to replace sooner rather than later. Instead, I used a black velvet curtain like you would see in a, uh, a theater. So, uh, the drum kit is set up due to size and uh, space constraints. I've got uh, basically a little table in the back corner there where I keep extra drumsticks, headphones, and uh, earplugs because it is an all-wood room. The all wood room provides a, a very strong level of resonance. Uh, there's some natural reverb in the room, but due to the odd angles, as you can see from here, the ceiling, I'm gonna have to dim the lights to be able to see that. See here, dim the lights on. There we go. Let's dim it down. So. The ceiling has uh, unusual angles. It goes pitched steeply here. This is uh, perpendicular with the floor. I'm sorry, parallel with the floor. And then that part slopes up. This part slopes more. Perpendicular to the floor. Over here we've got an angle right in front of that guitar, or right behind the guitar. And lighting glare makes it a little difficult but the uh, the sound booth had to be put in first as I think was in episode four uh, where this finished out you can see the the ceiling up above is I had to put uh, styrofoam up there a thick layer of uh, foam it's kind of like what a, a cooler was made out of. Uh, thin, maybe two inches thick. Put it up above the, uh, the, the, the booth and then tacked this board above that. The booth itself, uh, it's got a cracked window on the inside, but the, uh, the crack has been seamed with glass repair. Um, this was a a donation from a local hearing aid company because they had it in a, uh, a warehouse. So this booth provides extreme dampening. Uh, the, the sound pressure changes from in here 
and when you get in you can feel your ears just kind of start ringing immediately because it gets so quiet but the door is uh, rather heavy this thing's like a walk-in cooler almost so to get to the questions that I talked about at the intro uh, the the window from the control room into the studio itself uh, was picked up at a, uh, a local uh, glass company. It was uh, purchased by them for a, a business, and then the business needed to, due to fire codes, had to put in a window that could open, so they had this sitting on the floor. Uh, they sold me the, the window for 50 bucks. So this is, uh, I think it was 64 inches or so for the window. And the, the way that I put this window in, in the previous video you saw how I cut the frame out. Uh, I framed it in with two by fours uh, and mounted the, the frame to those two by fours and then put it into the hole that I would cut. The trick here to angling the window was I took a single one by six and then used a circular saw and I cut it at an angle and I made sure to leave enough of a, a gap at the top and bottom of that board as, as it was cut long ways so that the the single board provides both sides of the mount so when I put it in all I had to do was just put the window between those those two lines where I had cut, I used foam, like uh, packing foam, that you would uh, find inside of an Amazon package. I put that around the window itself, all the way around. It came on a roll at uh, Home Depot, I believe it was. I put that all the way around the window, and then once the window was in place, I used a razor knife to trim it, so that it's not visible. So. The, the idea here is that the window is not parallel with the rest of the room. For purposes of looking in or looking out, you also get an angular reflection. The way that this angle is right now, uh, my personal reflection is at the top, but I'm not nearly that tall, just because of the way that it's angled. So another question that uh, people may be asking, What's that in the corner? Bring the lights up. This is a dehumidifier. This is a basement. Basements are notoriously uh, humid. So, because this is all wood, both walls, ceiling, and floor, uh, expansion of the wood is a concern. The Dehumidifier will keep the relative humidity at a range where it doesn't change more than about five or six percent humidity. I keep it about 55. 50 to 55 is recommended for storing musical instruments, which is why you know you always have like an acoustic room in a guitar center or Sam, Sam Ash, that sort of thing. Because instruments will change their uh their uh, bend on the, the wood, uh, rather stress on the neck, will cause things to warp if you let the humidity vary too much over a long period of time. So the wires were displayed in episode four that were hanging behind what is now a wall. And I purchased most of everything that I've got here through Amazon from various uh, suppliers. You can see I've got it wired up on an interval. I've got a four jack panel XLR where the, the female connection is accessible from the studio. And then over here, you've got an eight port. There's four ports XLR at the top and the bottom is quarter inch stereo. So it's a grounded, XLR connection, I'm sorry, tip ring sleeve connection. 
So it alternates so that you've got four, eight, four on the other side of that curtain, eight again down here behind the piano, and then another four here, and then over here is the last eight. So that gives me four plus eight, plus 12, 12 again, and 12 again. So easy math, right? <laughs> but I can't do it in my head today. Uh, I guess it's 48 connections. Am I wrong? Yes, I'm wrong. That's 36. <laughs> so um, as for uh, layout, as you can see, the, the room itself is set up so that the drums are here. The reason why I chose this spot is because of the, the ceiling height and the angles. And I can get the overhead mics uh, and the room mic in front of it. And the reflections on this side are diffused because I've got multiple angles. So I don't get standing waves, even between the walls from one length of the room to the other. But if I were to stand over here and I play an instrument right here in the middle of the room, I get different uh, reflections. So I'm pointing at the floor now as I make my way to the control room. I'm pointing at the floor because I haven't finished this part yet and it's currently a laundry room. So you don't need to see my dirty laundry. So the control room itself, you can probably tell by the way my voice changed that the, uh, the room is kind of dead. So the wires from the studio were all run across the ceiling and brought in up here and behind this wall. I built myself a, uh, a block. These, these are boards that are sold. These were from Home Depot, I believe. Yeah. And they were for staircases, steps. They were already pre-painted white. And I essentially just made some cuts diagonally across the boards and then built a box that would be the right angle to fit into my corner. Uh, behind here you can see I've got a little gap and some dirt. So there's a little gap there and that was because there's nothing to mount to here and I needed something back here to be able to, to screw into the, the, the studs behind. So uh, all these panels again were purchased through uh, Actually, these, I believe, were through uh, Guitar Center online. And the top one I bought off of Amazon. Uh, this is a 24-port uh, a uh, panel and a 12-port. So, as I said, 36. You've got... I didn't label them yet because I can just look at them in my head and I know where they're at. This is the first four ports, which was on the, the south side of the house that I showed you first. So that's block one. Block two is these eight. Block three, block four, etc. So these were kind of a hassle to wire up because uh, I had to uh, put the, the wires into the, the, the ports and then use a voltage meter. Uh, I connected a battery on the other end to verify that I had the right wires because being, uh, again, I'm, doing, I'm an amateur at this. I didn't, uh, I did study audio video production in college back in the 90s, and I've done live sound and recording work for years, but this, this was, building the studio was not my forte. So uh, it, when it came down to it, labeling each wire individually was something that I didn't know I should have done. And I, in afterthought, I should have marked them clearly, put a piece of tape around it so that you know this is 1-1, one 1-2, dash one, one dash 1-3, one dash etc. It'll save you a lot of headache when it comes to finalizing the configuration. Uh, this is a double connector here, so it can be used for an XLR or a quarter-inch stereo. 
Uh, those also were purchased through Amazon. A great deal. I think I got 10 of them for, uh, I want to say, 20 bucks. So a pretty good deal. The configuration here so that when I am miking drums or I'm miking the piano or the guitars, um, the, the ports I use are usually the same. So like one and two here would be the room mics and then it would be like snare, high, high tom, mid tom, low tom, kick, that sort of, excuse me, that sort of thing. And those are patched in to the X32 Compact. Uh, I wanted to get a full-size X32 because it would give me more control uh, in, in real time. You would see the, the, the extra eight channels in real time as it was uh, being recorded. But as I, I considered it for my own use, I'm almost never going to have more than eight channels active at one time. Uh, my snare or my drum kit right now is set up so that the high tom is coming through on channel 16. That's just for convenience sake. Um, it's, it used to be on channel 8, but now it's on 16. I replaced 8 with the uh, snare mic on the bottom. And the, the, the way my brain works, it just had to be there. Um, the X32 is, uh, in my opinion, a great uh, DAW controller because you can uh, do a live show with it and set it up to that the buses are being controlled for, like, uh, these are your inputs, and these are your buses, and then there's your master control over here, and you can select individual channels. Right now, there's nothing coming in, so it's, it doesn't have anything to control. But... And my PC is off, which is why the DAW interface uh, didn't light up and everything connect. So the the X32 uh, has 16 direct inputs that are XLR on the back. Plus it has some uh, quarter inch, but I don't really use the quarter inch too much. Um, this isn't a promo video for the X32. I'm just trying to explain why I chose this particular one. It has uh, automatic uh, touch sensitivity so that if I am in the middle of a mix and I tell my uh, DAW, which I've used Cubase 10 now, I was on Cubase 9 for quite a while, but uh, when I have Cubase up and I tell it to record fader movements in real time as I'm doing the mix, if I move the fader up, the, the DAW records that movement and I don't have to select the channel in real time. I just move the fader and it knows that I moved the fader on, say, channel 1, channel 2, channel 3. The uh, PC that I have is uh, one that I built myself. It's uh, just kind of a, a Frankenstein, if you will, but uh, the highest speed RAM that you can get for whatever PC you build uh, Macintosh is often a preferred platform for recording, but I, I was an IT guy for Windows systems for many years, and that I just know how to deal with them. So uh, I've got a, a little uh, MIDI controller here so that I can uh, quickly key in MIDI tracks as I, without going into the studio itself. As you can see, you know, the piano's right there. And for that piano, we have a USB port on each side of the wall here. So you definitely want to be able to set that up. If you're building a studio, there's two different rooms, a control room for, and the studio itself. Be sure to remember the USB port because even modern amplifiers, modelers and whatnot, they have USB controls where you can change voices from the studio which can be extremely valuable if you are trying to uh, reamp a recording. So uh, that's something that uh, we could discuss in another video if, if people have interest in it, reamping. Uh, so the walls themselves, as you can see, those are the can lights that I talked about, the LEDs. I've got uh, the pyramid foam. Uh, this was bought in a, a box, uh, a large case 
from Guitar Center. I think it was like 250 bucks, but it was 16 two by two squares. To get these on the wall without damaging them, it was a simple matter of going to your local hardware store and buying some of these. The Scotch Indoor Mega Pack <laughs> adhesives. So you peel the tape off, you stick it on the wall, and then you put your your foam up and it adheres nicely. Uh, I put, because of the angles here, I wasn't too worried about reflections coming from the ceiling or the sidewall for standing waves, but I did want to dampen something above the couch here. And you can see, I put in a futon in here so that if, just by some coincidence, I have a, a, a family friend or something or a band in here recording and they get, they just need to take a nap had a long night at a gig or something like that, we can just you know extend out the food time. Uh, I've got here my little workbench, and here you can see this is the cable that I bought. Uh, it is uh, it's been serving me well. I haven't been seeing hearing any buzz through the uh, the the mics, uh, even when it is really cranked up, no buzz for gain. Uh, this was again a uh, an Amazon purchase, and I, I I bought two of these 500 foot rolls, used all of one roll, and I've got just a little bit left that I'm going to be using for uh, mic cables. The, uh, the actually patch cables. These are the connectors themselves. Again, a 10 pack of these, XLR, male and female, five of each was I think 20 bucks so I think it was like 80 bucks for 500 feet of cable and 20 bucks so you got a hundred dollars invested in the connectors and the cable and you could make five cables that are 100 feet long how much is that going to cost you if you go buy it probably more than 30 dollars a piece so uh as far as the table configuration it's a good idea to have a uh uh, a, a soldering iron that you have variable temperature control on. If you're soldering your stuff, you want to be able to get the right temperature and the tips. Uh, buy extra tips because you're going to go through a few of them if you're making this many cables. Uh, a little table clamp. This was invaluable for holding the, the cable and holding the, the tips while soldering so you could have both hands free. Uh, this is, uh, I went to my local micro center which is a, a computer store near me, and I bought this ta table clamp. So it just clamps onto the table, and then it's uh, got different axes, axes that you can rotate it upon. If you loosen up the bolts, it's got like a lock down here and a lock here for the vise. Very handy to have. Proper wire strippers, something to manipulate the uh, the wire position, basically holding the wire in place while you're soldering it sometimes is necessary because the mic cables, they uh, after they're tend, sometimes they want to kind of walk away from where you're going when you heat them up. Uh, so the carpeting, the walls, the window from the inside, the soundproofing. Well, I went with the JBL uh, 308s for studio monitors. Uh, I'm sorry, those are the 305s. Uh, the 308 was just a little too big for my environment, and I may need to uh, get a uh, base subwoofer to kind of give me a real presentation, but these have been serving me very well. They have incredible sound for the price. Uh, I think $1.99 a piece is their regular retail, and uh, they often go on sale for like $1.49. So thank you for watching. If you have any questions about uh, specific things that were used in the construction or things I may have not thought about answering in this video, feel free to post them in the comments. I'll do my best to get back to you. And if I, if I have enough questions, I'll put up a video <laughs> answering those questions. Uh, I hope that uh, this has been helpful for everyone and may your studio turn out as well as mine did.